Okay, uh, I want to start with a few words about history as it pertains to mathematics, uh, just to get us started in the course. Now, you might ask the question, why would we be interested in the history of mathematics? Uh, and of course, it's always interesting to know what happened in the past. And, you know, we want to know how did things come to be that the way they are? Uh, but I think the, the, the best reason is that to fully understand a subject, you need to look at its, it, its history. For math majors, this is probably the first course you're going to take at Truman where you actually look at mathematics as a whole. Instead of just sort of diving deep into a particular subject like calculus or algebra or geometry, here we're going to take a sort of like an external view. We're going to have a look at the big picture and try and sort of understand mathematics in its entirety. Now, what would be some of the problems with that? Well, there's this bad thing in history called the Whig theory of history. And that's where you view the past uh, as anticipation and program preparation for the present. So, you know, so all things lead linearly to the present. Uh, that's the sin of teleology, uh, which basically means you explain things in terms of the purpose uh, rather than the cause from which they arise. Okay. Um, Another problem is like just by condensing things down to a history, you have this brevity and that creates a distortion. Um, you know, there's actually lots of missing links. Uh, in, in mathematics, we do this thing where we like to polish results, polish proofs. And so, you know, someone proves something some way and then someone else comes up with a better proof and then someone does it better. And so in the end, you have this polished edifice and it's kind of really hard to see uh, how it really came about. Um, another problem is with mathematics is uh, when we have this internal view, it's kind of very Platonist. Uh, we kind of think of this ideal world of mathematical truth uh, that Math is a world apart, um, it's abstract and universal, it's independent of time and setting. We really want to smash that last one. We really want to look at its time and setting. Uh, we kind of think of mathematics as the highest of the scientists, up highest of the sciences, the language of science, etc. And so what we really want to do is want to have a look kind of like look at an external view of mathematics in which that mathematicians are more the creation of the field uh, than its creator. That there isn't sort of transcendental truth, but there's kind of like distinctive practices and skills and activities that uh, mathematicians do at particular times, at particular places. Um, you know, we want to, you know, what was normal for, you know, Mesopotamia in the year 2000 BC? That's kind of what we want to want to get at. Um, and so I, I really don't want to define what mathematics is. Um, rather, I want to say that there's a mode of thought called mathematics. It's intrinsic to human nature and it's common to all sort of different cultures. Um, so what do I mean by proto-mathematics? So look, in everyday life, you use mathematics, right? You, you, know, you could, figure out the tip at the restaurant, you want to build a table, so you're going to measure and cut things, uh, you've got a recipe, you're going to double it. So there's a certain level of mathematics that everyone has to do just to, to get through life. Uh, and this, this has been like all through history and prehistory. So when humans started to gather into, you know, urbanize, gather into cities and started trading with each other, um, you know, just the fact that, that we needed to organize these human societies gave rise to mathematics. So the earliest forms of writing are, you know, found little clay tablets, which are tax receipts. So to be able to 
for someone to be able to figure out taxes, they needed sort of math. And so in ancient times, scribes learned mathematics. Uh, another impetus for, for sort of creating mathematics was astrology. You know, they saw the stars, they saw the regular motion, and uh, the fact that you've got regular cyclic motion means that, you know, to be able to, to um, figure out when Mars is in Taurus, you have to uh, solve some sort of linear congruences. You've got to do a little bit of uh, algebra. Okay, um, so what do I mean by mathematics? I'm going to, instead of define, I'm going to talk about like these four modes of mathematics. Uh, number, by number, I mean like counting, measuring, ordering things. Uh, space, so like shapes. Um, uh, symbols, so, so the first two, number and space, are kind of, occur kind of naturally and we see evidence of these like in animals animals can count animals can tell the difference between circles and ellipses like there's a famous experiment that pavlov done where he showed circles and ellipses to dogs and when they were shown a circle they would get a reward and then he'd get the ellipse and he'd make it more circular until finally i think it was like when you've got the ratio of six to the major axis to five to the minor axis, the dog would go crazy because he didn't know whether he was dealing with a circle and ellipse. Okay. Um, children. So if you look at education theory, someone like Jean Piaget, you know, he talked about, you know, young children, you know, we need to, to, to teach them about number and space that this was just sort of came naturally to them uh, in, prehistory we can find evidence you know like of uh, you know there's this famous bone that's like 70,000 years old I think it's a wolf's femur where there's these notches on it and somehow it's counting something to do with the moon it's it's all very complicated so it like 70,000 years ago someone was having these interesting mathematical thoughts okay um, then when we add to that symbols, this is this idea that in math, we do sort of abstract things. So just to say three plus seven just equals 10, uh, that statement actually is, you know, thousands of years of human thought went into that. It, the whole idea that we can abstract things down to symbols uh, is very powerful in mathematics. And then the fourth thing that makes up is inference. So you have these bunch of kind of mathematical statements and somehow you could, you could, you know, you can use logic or whatever to come up with some mathematical conclusion. So, you know, inference that kind of leads further on uh, to proof. Okay, so in history of math one, we're doing up to 1600. Why that particular date? Well, 1600 is you know, thought to be like the birth of modern science, the birth of modern physics, like with people like Kepler, Galileo and Newton. Uh, and so astronomy turned from, you know, I talked about before with astrology and these linear congruences to suddenly you're doing astrophysics with the law of gravity. Uh, we've got calculus. And so this this together with kind of like the birth of physics is, is a major paradigm shift in, um, in mathematics. And, and so we're going to be dealing with pre-calculus. So calculus has always been this kind of big thing in mathematics. And so it, it becomes like a natural marker for us. Another reason is um, 1600 really marks point of like dominance of the West in mathematical thought. Um, we're going to see that there's plenty of cultures who have very strong mathematics, for example, the Chinese. So before 1600, if you wanted to solve an equation, the best place to have gone would have been China. But um, we're going to see that in classical Greece, they arose the idea of, of the proof through Euclid. Um, this arose because of how they did things in classical Greek. They liked to argue, they had philosophers, etc. Uh, they, they discovered the existence of irrationals. This kind of freaked them out and led them to, to 
to have the idea of the proof. And once that got to China, for example, in the 1500s, 1600s by Portuguese Jesuits, once Chinese mathematicians saw Euclid, they, their eyes lit up and they said, oh yeah, we want more of this. And so they started doing uh, Western mathematics. Okay, um, so since it's pre-calculus, the, the topics we're gonna cover are arithmetic, algebra, number theory, combinatorics, geometry and trigonometry. So they're pretty standard um, what people do in high school and before calculus. Um, but, you know, as I said, as we'll see, tastes change, mathematical tastes change over time. And so we'll all have, also have to include spherical geometry and spherical trigonometry, which is something which is not really taught that much nowadays, but before 1600s, it's really important, you know, for example, for navigation. We're not gonna be doing any probability, okay? Which is a bit strange, right? Because that's a pretty elementary mathematical subject. But again, we're talking about taste here. Before 1600, probability wasn't really a thing. Um, to be able to do probability, you've got to sort of believe in randomness, which is not really in the mindset of the people back then. And so that's another discovery that happens around 1600. There's this famous um, correspondence between Pascal and Fermat, where basically probability is invented. Okay, so that's another reason why we're having that 1600 endpoint. Okay, thank you.